This is Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, hello, welcome to episode number 122, you had it right, of Musical Talk. I'm sitting across from my very good friend, Dominic Lindsay Beaton, who hasn't joined us for about a thousand million years. Yeah, I well, I don't think I don't think it's been a thousand million years, because that would make you incredibly old, Nick. I am incredibly old. Yes, I turned 25 this year. Oh, God, you turned 25. How shocking. <laughs> Nearly anyway, but here, I, But I'm, I'm here now. I'm here now and you looking are. forward to doing the 122nd episode now, of in, Musical Talk. In this episode, Lisa is going to be interviewing Julie Atherton, which is a long-requested guest we've had on for this episode. So that'll be very exciting yeah. for all our listeners. Dom and I have recently come back from two brand-new musicals of different styles different styles and different areas of london as well yes in the west end and one in hammersmith due to transfer to the west end yeah is do you know if it's if it's actually going ahead but i'm guessing on the ticket sales at the lyric it'll happen by the way if that if me saying the venue is the lyric and nick saying it's in hammersmith if that hasn't given away what musical i saw then um you need to check up on your west end musical knowledge yes and turn off um (laughs) It may go to the Lyric in the West End, which would be quite funny. They wouldn't, yeah, they wouldn't yeah. have to change any of their publicity material. Yeah, yeah. Um, we are, of course, talking about Spring Awakening, which Dom saw last night. Mm-hmm. So it's quite fresh in your memory. Yes, it is. A couple of weeks ago, I saw Oliver at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane, which listeners to the show will know how excited I've been about this uh very, very big, big, big production. Big we, know, produ- we know how much I like my big production. Exactly, that's that's what draws Nick to the theatre anyway, it's yes. just big productions. Like you said, two very big, well, two very good and very different musicals that are opening to sell out crowds, yes. quite frankly. In your face recession, that's what I want to say. Exactly. Well, what's his name? The, the I can't remember, the, 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 like the, the, the director of uh, Dior, you know, um, the, I mean the the he company, like the company oh, director of the company. No, 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 of Dior. You know, he he famously last week or something said, um, "I know there's a recession, but there's no recession in creativity." And then said, "There's no recession in the house of Dior," which is a fantastic say. There's no, there's recession. no recession in Chiswick, I might say, where I live. Well, there's there's no. You, hang on, that's a completely another show. Let's get back to the musicals. Yes. Yeah. So Nick, how how was Oliver? How was Oliver? Oliver, as we talked about in the show, is a revival of a revival. Mm. Uh, The 1994 Sam Mendes London Palladium production, which was big and very impressive. Big, went down a storm. Played for four years or something, which is quite impressive for the Palladium. Uh, A multitude of stars starred in that version. Jonathan Price, Jim Dale, Barry Humphreys. Of course, this London one has Rowan Atkinson and the winner of the TV show behind it. Now, I didn't see Jodie Prenger or Prenger, or whatever her name is in the production I saw. I saw Tamsin Carroll. For me, the best thing, I... Okay, I cried at this production. That's how really? emotionally moved I was by wow. it. Not because of the story, because the story is a bit simple in a way, really. Oh. Little kid. Yeah, well... Runs away. Hang, okay, yes. Hangs out with All a couple right. of thieves. Okay, we're, we're going to debate that in a second. But you, So you didn't cry at the story, which is why I was going to say fair enough, because I thought if you cried at the story, it's, it's, it's a tragic story. Okay, yes, go ahead and cry. But what, what made you cry? If, was someone sitting on your foot or something? I cried because it was such a... I've been, I was looking forward so much to this production. And at the curtain call, you know, everyone was standing up and cheering and whooping. And I was, I was like, yes, it's finally back in London and it's bigger and better. It's than home. It, it's yeah. ever than, bigger and better than it ever was yeah. before. Um, consider yourself at home, I think, is the yeah. phrase that comes into mind. Yeah. Um, we don't need to talk about the history of Oliver because Tim and I did that in great detail a couple of weeks yes. ago. But this production th- This particular. production was perfect in a way. Mm-hmm. I mean... I saw it with a friend of mine, a fan of musical talk called Sandra, who is from Sweden, and her friend Vicky. Hello, Sandra. Hello, I'm sure Sandra. she's listening. Yes, she, Vicky, and I really, really loved it. And it was, it's a, this production is dark, but it, but it should be. I mean, a production yeah. like Oliver, if they tried to make it, which is something that uh, I'll talk about in Spring Awakening as well. But if they tried to make it light and fluffy, it just it wouldn't people would have been throwing stones at the producers well probably not not the producers but they would have been throwing stones somewhere i'm the sure actors. yeah not to uh, belittle the complexity of such a great show but 
what are the sort of things that you walked away thinking, my God, that was good, that was incredible, that was, I mean, anything from the actors to the design. To... Sets, orchestrations, Rowan Atkinson and the songs. Sets, orchestrations, Rowan Atkinson and the songs. So the set, but I, I was under the impression that the set is pretty similar to Sam Mendes, Sam Mendes's set. It is, mm-hmm. but because it's in a completely different new space, right? And this is a big space. I didn't know how big this space was, and I've been on stage at the Theatre Royal Drury mm-hmm. Lane, as you do. Yeah, as you do when and, you when you broke in yeah. at night and the police were chasing you <laughs> for, for, for like the first ten minutes of the show. You you see half the stage, and you think, okay, this is pretty big. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the whole stage is revealed when Oliver is running, yeah. he's escaping, and you, it's just the biggest thing you've ever seen. It's a hundred really? feet deep. Crikey. From the back to the front. And that is a... That's a that's a big stage. And when you have one kid running One around, kid, yeah. The gravity of it, I yeah. suppose, will be overwhelming. And it, it, it's such a beautiful theatre and it's, you know, it's just... It, it, as you say, it's home. Mm-hmm. And, and Lionel Bart, who died, I think, ten years ago now, Yeah, ten years ago now. Would have... He'd be so happy that his production is now mm-hmm. the best-selling show, the West End... The West End, the West End has ever had because it's, you know, it's made fifty. The, the million. preview sales yeah. alone, let yeah. alone people trying to buy tickets now. Advanced you know? sales, yeah. fifteen million pounds. Yeah, because you know Cameron needed it. Yeah, he needed got, it. it's got the swimming pool fund to sort. Yeah, out. <laughs> but Rowan Atkinson. Yeah, he, he was what stuck with me and many other people. He, you're not seeing Mr. Bean on stage, mm-hmm. but there, 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 there are elements of Mr. Yeah. Bean. Yeah, and stage. I, but I think in in a way as well. You know, obviously, I, I'm only going on the reviews, and that there's a lot of photography, you know, press releases of pictures, images of the show, and Rowan Atkinson Fagan in action. So I'm only going on that, um, but maybe you can confirm this or or um, denounce it with your entire heart. But there must be an element of an audience going to see it will be that's Mr. Bean, especially if they've got kids. I mean, worldwide phenomenon. Even when I'm in the Philippines, Mr. Bean is played on TV because he's he's universal. So there must be an element works, of the it, fact that it, it, they they must know there's a bit of Mr. Bean superstar in there because that's like an insider joke between... Mr. Bean is in this. They wouldn't know. Yes. Because, you know, no six-year-old kid knows the name Rowan Atkinson. Yeah, exactly. Um, we have to consider he's a very experienced physical performer. Mm-hmm. If you've seen his drum, invisible drum kit Yeah, sketches, which made him, and pretty much. And his piano sketch. Yeah. And th- this is what he does. He's very... And Fagin, in a way, is a sort of mime artist because he teaches all these kids mm-hmm. how mm-hmm. to do... Pick a how to pick a pocket or two. Yeah, the Independent newspaper said he couldn't sing. I disagree with that totally because mm. he they're more patter songs, they're more speaking songs than yeah. big belting numbers. You yeah. give that to Nancy. He did his job incredibly well, and he brought he brought comedy to the role. Mm-hmm. During rehearsals, he would improvise with he would just improvise jokes. And one mm-hmm. brilliant joke: if you haven't seen the show, don't listen to this. Skip forward about five avert seconds. your ears. Um, he's going through his box of jewels. <laughs> that he has hidden, and he comes across his opera glasses. And he puts them on. He says, I've always wanted to go to the opera so I can sit in the audience and look at the rich people. And he looks at the stalls, mm-hmm. and he slowly raises his neck up to yeah. the top of the theatre, and all the poor people. Mm-hmm. And that just brought the house down. Yeah. You know, that's that's not what Lionel Bart wrote. Yes. And, but, you're, but, but that's not Mr. Bean. That's Rowan Atkinson mm-hmm. being... Devising yeah. his Fagan. And his Fagan, right. Reviewing the situation is a very, very comic... It's a, it's a comic song anyway. Mm-hmm. Our friend Bill Brown, who orchestrated the show, mm-hmm. told me a story of how the first thing Rowan said to him was, I've been thinking about this song, thinking about this character, and I want... Can we change it from a clarinet solo to a violin solo? Yes. Because there's lots of cadenzas in the song. Yeah. And so they did, and Rowan Atkinson sort of mimes the violin and he sort of uh, dances around yeah. like you know sort of mis- in, in a Mr. Bean way in a physical way yeah, it, yeah. So it's very phys- physically funny yeah which brings a great joy to the evening because mm-hmm. it's such a dark story yeah kids in slavery throughout the whole thing mm-hmm. you know whether you're working for an, an, a, a workhouse or, 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 or sites whoever or, you're, yeah. it's slavery yes it's a production that I think is you know, I I can't wait to see it again, and I I was I wasn't sitting in the best seats, mm-hmm. so I'd like to see it again sitting in the best seats because the sets 
By best seats, I mean, do you mean that you were sat seats. up in the gods? I, or I was you... very high up in the gods, so I yeah. didn't get a lot of the perspective tricks that the, the sets were playing on you. They have, right. you know, buildings that glide yeah. across the stage and things, and apparently St. Paul's was in there somewhere, and I completely missed that. <laughs> that's that's because very interesting. The, because of the depth of the stage, yeah. they play with perspective a lot. Yeah, But in, in a similar vein, though, doesn't that mean that wherever you're sat, you'll almost get your own your own version of it? Yeah. So actually, you know, so so it's not that you missed out on some things because maybe you would have seen elements from where you were. Other audience members mm. might not have if they're in the front five rows of the stalls or something. We saw bits we weren't meant to see, like we saw actors gathering behind a, a prop piece. And right, things. yes. Um, £22.70 for not the worst seats in the house, but you're yeah. still pretty far up. It's not bad mm-hmm. for a production of this magnitude. Mm-hmm. And it moves so swiftly and it's so cinematic. Yeah. And what Cameron does here is when he has a film to base it on, he wants to bring the, the cinematic experience onto the stage, like yeah. he did for My Fair Lady and this yeah. Oliver. Which is, quite obviously. frankly, what Sam Mendes did in the reverse, mm. is, you know, American Beauty, Road to Perdition, although they're very, you know, they're, they're definitely the medium of film, they're two brilliant films, and he's using that medium, there are genuine moments of theatricality in both of those films that make them so good. He's bringing his devices, his knowledge from the stage, and transposing them to the film. Like that know? one shot in um, American Beauty where you have almost a proscenium march in yes. the frame and they're sitting at the dinner table and it's just Exactly. That's... Anyway, but so so that's Ron Atkinson. Uh, the songs, the songs, you mentioned the songs. What? They're, they're classics, yeah. aren't they? I mean, Are they pretty, I mean, were they anticipated? In, you know, in, in a good way, in a you're excited because you know it's coming up or had they done some new things with them that no one saw coming? They added some new dance sections mm-hmm. into like a new a whole new ragtime section into Consider Yourself, which I always thought was meant to be there. Yeah. Um, oh, and they t- they and so you wrote to them saying, I've always thought <laughs> there well, should be this ragtime section. Sincerely, Nick Hudson, Musical Talk. Lots of more tricks in the orchestrations, like, for example, Bill. There's a lyric in Pick a Pocket or Two when they have Robin Hood, what a crook, gave away mm-hmm. what he took. Bill put coconuts in there, so it sounds like horse yeah. hooves. They swung certain sections. It, it, just, oh. it just sort of brought a sort of extra value to this yeah. production. And they're coming out on the I think 16th or 13th of March, sometime in mid-March, is mm-hmm. the cast album of oh, this show, wow. which is recorded live. Wow. Over four nights. So So they do they pick and choose the best yeah, well, well, they renditions. They, they edit it all together. Yes. It's a very, very timely process. Yeah. People, people say, Oh, um, it must be cheaper than well, no, no, I'm, no, it, hiring I'm a sure studio. It's... No, you're hiring a group of people to work very hard yeah. putting together an album yeah. and mixing it all. But I think what you'll get in the live recording, which you don't get in the studio recordings, mm-hmm. is actors bouncing off an audience. Yes. In the moment, they'll yeah. they'll hit something that they wouldn't have if they were just playing to an empty empty yeah. theater. You know. Hopefully, we'll get the full versions of all the songs. Some scenes I felt did lag on a bit. You know, the, the book isn't perfect, and because I don't know the original story, because I know the original story, but I don't know the source material from which yeah. it's based. There are bits where it just sort of drags on a bit, and then you have first act is much stronger than the first. In regard to songs, and second, the second act, I see is what you mean. Yeah. Where the, a lot of the, the story happens, happens. Yeah. yeah, drives it along. But it doesn't feel old fashioned at all, mm-hmm. which is good, I think. Yeah, very good. For a musical written in the 50s, because yeah. the other show we had in the 50s was Salad Days. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which is, um, is Cameron McIntosh going to try, and, try well, and revive that one? Well, Salad Days was the show that got Cameron McIntosh in love with theatre. If you've seen the Hey Mr. Producer DVD, mm-hmm. there's something called in, it, in it called The Magic Piano, a character from right. Salad Days. Right that sings and plays and Cameron was inspired as to how this magic piano worked so that's what got Cameron that's into it. so it all comes back to Salad well, Days I, well let, let's say I, I, I don't think, think we'll have Salad Days at the jury level yeah no, I, let's say we're, we're glad that Oliver was the one that got the revival there yes. I encourage everyone to go and see it not that you'll be able to but you can try well you never know you know I mean there are, there are always there are always ways you know um I mean, the more the more internet things you sign up to, the more last minute seats. You know, you get one in the morning that says ten seats released for tonight's performance at a reduced price or matinee shows. You know, so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be discouraged by the fact that it has sold out. I would uh, get sit, excited you, you about can, the fact that you could see it in a month. You can still sit where I sat, and you, they're not bad seats. Yeah. You'll hear everything. the sound is brilliant. And if the, if the stage is so big and so elaborate, you're not going to miss no, the you, story. You want to be further back anyway. Yeah. For, I mean, 260 speakers are in this auditorium. <laughs> Sort of where we sat for Lord of the Rings, mm-hmm. but not as far back, so mm. it's fine. It's just a bit hot and cramped up there, and if you're mm-hmm. six foot two like I am, 
you're going to be such like a contortionist. Yeah. We're going to hand you over to Lisa now, who's going to be interviewing Star of West End, a producer and uh, great all-round entertainer. This is Lisa's interview with Judy Atherton. Musical Talk. Today we're here with Julie Atherton, who most of you will know as currently being in Avenue Q. Hi Julie, how are you? I'm good, thank you. You? I'm very well, thank you. It's lovely <laughs> to have you on the show. No problem. Did you survive last week's snow? Uh, yes, I did. It was, it was quite nice because we got a show off. So, <laughs> so I snowed, it, snowed in my new house. So that was good. I got to unpack a few boxes. So. <laughs> Were you not out building a snowman then? I was as well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Had to be done. Had to be done. Did it all. <laughs> um, I suppose the, the easiest thing to sort of start off with is what actually got you into musical theatre? Well, basically, I did uh, drama at college at Sixth Form College and uh, my drama teacher really encouraged me um, and I wasn't, I wasn't any good at anything else so, <laughs> so basically um, that was sort of my only hope and uh, yeah I just sat in the library one day and thought right I've got to look up I didn't know anything about drama schools in London so I just looked up a few quite like the sound of Mount View went for the audition got it yeah it just, just all went from there really it worked out really well then yeah <laughs> yeah it did, did you, but yeah once I set my mind to something then you know that's it it's <laughs> a good way to be yeah <laughs> was there any sort of shows that you'd, you'd seen before that you saw and you thought I'd quite like to that's something I'd quite like to do or what well I'd heard the soundtrack to um, Miss Saigon absolutely fell in love with that show so uh, I sang a song from that for my audition and while I was in London I went to go and see it and I was like yep definitely this is what I want to do I want to do musical theatre definitely and it's really funny because um, I saw uh, Joanna Ample play Miss Saigon and uh, she is working with me now oh, in of Avenue Q it's Christmas yeah. Eve <laughs> that was really sweet <laughs> I was like yeah that's quite strange how it all fits yeah. together what song did you sing if you don't mind me asking um, I'd give my life for you that's a nice song it's yeah a, it's, a good, it's a good cast recording I've, yeah, I can I've, obviously I've, never play that part though <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame. you could play Ellen <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> At the moment, obviously, you're in Avenue Q, but you, you've done shows before that. What that you've done before has, has been the favourite thing that you've worked on? I left Avenue Q for a bit and did a few shows and, and a few workshops as well. And actually, a workshop of a show that hopefully will happen called Through the Door by Lawrence Mark White. I'm singing a song from it at the What's On Stage Awards. And I did it again for Perfect Pitch. We, we did a bit of it at Perfect Pitch. And um, I think it's brilliant. I think, well, I think it could be brilliant mm-hmm. if it was um, given enough money. I think, that, I think that's been my favourite because it's just exciting. I, I just like working on new things, to be honest. Yeah. Do you find that easier to do than, than go into sort of predefined roles? or? Oh, yeah, it's much better because you get to create it yourself and... You know, you're not being made to be a carbon copy of somebody else. Uh, it's really nice when you develop it yourself. So, yeah, I, I, new work is the way forward. I think producers need to take more risks. It's something we talk about a lot in, on the podcast, it, is the fact there's we, we get a lot of transfers over from Broadway at the moment. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a real shame that we're not getting the rising talent quite as... getting as much exposure as they perhaps should get, as well as the the revivals that go on just now so yeah it's um, something I'm fighting for definitely I'm on a crusade (laughs) to get new work in the West End it sounds like a good one well I think a lot of people are behind me with it so um, I think if we all pull together and try and get it done I mean Perfect Pitch is a great we we started with Notes from New York really um, Mm mm-hmm when we were just bringing it wasn't like bringing shows over we were, we were just bringing you know a taste of songs that were happening in New York and just saying look there's new work out there and, and then we did like a Not From New York which was British talent and um, you know there's so much of it out there and I did, I did my album for, of Charles Miller songs because you know he's unknown and 
I just think we need to stop listening to the old ones. It's like watching the same... You, you don't watch the same films over and over again at the cinema, do you? There's always new films coming out, so why isn't it the same with musical theatre? I think there's a, a need for more to be done. And I, yeah. know the, I know the Notes from New York series has been quite successful, hasn't it? Yeah, 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 it's been great. Uh, certainly. I know the confusion it causes on Facebook when people talk about going for Christmas in New York... <laughs> Oh, right. No, no, not Christmas, actually, in New York. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my friends are always saying that. I'm saying, yeah, I'm doing Christmas in New York next week. Oh, you're in New York? I'm like, no, 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 no. Oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Forget it. Forget it, yeah. We'll start again. <laughs> Speaking of New York, obviously you originated the role of Kate Monster and Lucy the Slut over in London. What was yeah. that like? It was fantastic. It was great because we still got to create things. Mm-hmm. It was really hard work, but it was just um, a few of us in a room with a lot of puppets and a few mirrors just going, ah, trying to get things right and trying to make things look natural. And, you know, it, yeah, it was really good fun because we got to create a few things. Obviously, there was some things that had to stay the same, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was really, really, really nice. What was the addition process like for Avenue Q? Really, really weird because... Uh, Obviously, at your final, you normally know exactly what you're doing and you're doing something that you're very good at. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> in this audition, you weren't. <laughs> it was just awful because <laughs> uh, you, you were puppeteering, but you were rubbish at it. So oh, it, no. just, it just felt just really weird. But everyone was, you know, there was nobody that was a professional puppeteer. So it just felt a bit weird because I was like, well, I know... I know my um, script and I know the song and blah, 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 but I don't know how to work this thing. <laughs> but, you know, you still had to do it and just sort of blag your way through it. Oh, it's weird. <laughs> Were you singing a song from the show at the time or...? Yeah, yeah, I had to do Fine Line and oh. do it with Kate Monster thinking, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> it was just really weird. But, it must um, have been very ne- nerve-wracking. Yeah, it was, it was. It was just strange, really, because you just knew you weren't very good at it, but you just... <laughs> anyway, on with it and hope for the best. But they were just seeing, you know, from, from each audition how much you'd improved. Yeah. It's not something you can easily practice, I suppose. Is it? Uh, ish, but you can't take the puppets home with you, so you can't really practice, if you know what I mean. No. <laughs> it's very different when you put the puppet on. How easy or difficult is it to control the puppets? Well, now I find Kate Monster quite easy. Now mm-hmm. I'm used to it. I mean, I still find Lucy quite hard because she's got two rods. Uh-huh. So you, like, hold both the rods in one hand. So you've got yeah. to move them both with one hand, which is just hard. <laughs> and even now, sometimes, I drop one of them during the show. I'm oh. like, oh, God, <laughs> she's got one arm. <laughs> are, they, are they quite light, or do your arms ache at the end? I'm used to it now, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> They're quite, it's like, I don't know, bag like of shopping. <laughs> you know, you pick it up at first, and then after a few minutes, you're like, OK, now I want to put it down, <laughs> but you can't. No need to go to the gym, then? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> What's the sort of, the the going from that, the best and worst things about being in Avenue Q? With, because it is quite different with the puppet angle, is it's... it's and it's a great show. I mean, I love it. I saw it. Um, I was really late coming to it. I saw it last year in New York. Um, oh, I love it. Yeah. I, I'm I was having a real. I love my job the other day. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, but, uh, but that's really nice to do because obviously you came back to it. Is it quite yeah. quite strange second time around? Yeah, it was. Yeah, the, like the first time I did it, I, I got a bit of stage fright towards the end because I've been doing it so long. So when I came back to it, literally the second night back. I got a stage fright again. It was really horrible because oh, no. you sort of know something so well that you yeah. don't know it anymore. <laughs> so the second night back, I think I was just so nervous about it. I just got, I, I got it again, and you just have like voices in your head. You're going, you're gonna forget it. You're gonna forget it, and it's horrible. Oh. Um, but then I just completely got over it, and I just love it now. Getting over that hurdle must be quite daunting. <laughs> oh, it's weird. Yeah, it, t- it took me about a week to get over it the first time. It was just horrible. I didn't. I just didn't want to go on stage. <laughs> but it was fine. I mean, I had people in like the times where I'd had it really, really bad, and um, they didn't notice at all. You know, you just can't notice. It's just inside my heart. It's pounding, and I'm shaking, and I'm thinking, I do not know what I'm saying anymore. <laughs> it's just coming out of my mouth, but I don't know what it means. <laughs> but it must be an awful feeling for you, but at least you know it's not translating over. So yeah, yeah. That's, that's some consolation for the feeling awful for a short while. <laughs> yeah. 
Is it easier or more difficult to sort of get into character in a show like Avenue Q? Because you don't really have a costume, you just have the puppet. You just look at this little thing next to you and that's the character. I don't know, you just sort of become the character when you put it on. They are really cute puppets. I know, I love Kate. She's brilliant. (laughs) Help but love Kate. I know. (laughs) So cute. (laughs) I know you did the last five years recently. Oh, I loved it. There we go, that answers my question. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely loved it. It was brilliant. I know that's that was very popular and it was extra dates added, weren't there? Yeah, yeah, and they sold out as well. Yeah, it was brilliant. What did you enjoy the most about it? Was it just the fact that it was something... Well, I just loved that show so much and I'd always wanted to do it. So when I was asked to do it, I was just over the moon. I think, well, I cried actually. When I was asked, I was, oh my God, I can't believe it. <laughs> I was really chuffed to do it anyway. It was just such a challenge as well because it's a massive thing, that show. Mm. Working with um, Amelia Sears as well and Fiona Laird, you know, they're just fantastic directors. We just had a whale of a time on it. Everything was right. One of the things that I've been, I was asked when I said I was going to be speaking to you was, could you ask Julie, would they please make a London cash recording? Oh, of Avenue Q or no, last five no, years? Of last five years. That's, it was one of the things came back to me. <laughs> ask nicely. So. Oh, well, it's not up to me. <laughs> I would like that too. I thought you might say that. (laughs) Have you got a favourite show or event that you've done? Would the last five years be be up there and one of your favourite things? Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, I was was so scared that first night. Well, not just nervous, scared. (laughs) Just the whole enormity of it, really. You start the show. and, And also, I have to go backwards in the show, which was really hard because you have to start off at the end of the relationship and then get happier towards the end really (laughs) so to start off and to try and it's hard to win an audience over straight away when you're miserable (laughs) really because they just think I don't really care (laughs) because I don't I don't know what's come before this why why are you crying on me (laughs) I knew that was going to be really difficult that first song so yeah, I think I just shook from start to finish, really, through that show. <laughs> but I'm so glad I did it. It was such a relief when we'd done it. It just felt like we'd climbed a mountain. <laughs> but yeah, it was great. And to do it with Paul as well. I mean, he's just one of my best friends in the whole world. Would you, would he's you my like, stage husband. <laughs> your stage husband. Would you like to do it again for longer? Or was it was that enough? It was just right, but but yeah, obviously, yeah. I, I mean, I'd love to, yeah. Everyone I know who went um, has taunted me relentlessly ever since about how good it was. Oh. <laughs> Thanks oh, for that. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I know, obviously, because you're working at the moment, you probably don't get a chance to see a lot of theatre, but is there anything sort of the last few years that you've seen that you've thought that is just fantastic? I'd love a chance to do that. I absolutely loved PF. It's not something I... I could do, I don't think. <laughs> Part of it is for the fact I can't speak French. But um, that was absolutely fantastic. Seeing Eleanor Roger play, that was just amazing. I saw it at the Donmar. I haven't seen the West End one, but that was incredible. I have to have, what else have I seen? I can't remember. There's something else. <laughs> I can't remember, but anyway. <laughs> I mean, I was absolutely in tears by the end of that. Have you seen it? I haven't, actually. Oh, you it's, must. It's it's one of those uh, things I, I would like to see. But um, I'm actually based in Scotland, so uh, I have to commute in order to see things. That didn't I stop see. me last year, though. I saw a lot last <laughs> year. So um, choosing things is quite difficult. <laughs> it's, you have to you have to go through a process of elimination of what I really, yeah. really, really want to see. <laughs> which is, it's probably just as well. I don't live in London. I'd be absolutely bankrupt. But <laughs> never mind. Never mind. I, I know you've got um, an album, as you mentioned, have you yeah. got any plans to sort of do a follow-up to that at the moment? Like yes, I have. <laughs> you do? Yeah, I'm going to be working on that this year, really, just get, getting it together and choosing what I'm going to sing on it. So, yeah, I'll be doing that this year. But we've just relaunched a, a remastered version of the album anyway because the first one all sold out, and rather than just print some more off, we decided to remaster it. So, you know, there's, like, a few more guitars and some of the songs and blah, blah, blah. And it's being sold with a free copy of Fine Line. Ooh. Yeah, so buy it. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, do, you have, do you have a favourite track on it? 
I suppose I don't know <laughs> it changes really um, heaven knows I got my own way on that one so I like that one <laughs> didn't have to stick to a drum beat which is nice <laughs> that's quite good but yeah I do like Girl A Few Words that's, that's why we open with that one because it's nice and spunky <laughs> I think my favourite ones on it is um, You Know How To Love Me oh really I don't know why but it gets incredibly stuck in my head Okay. <laughs> I, I just really like the track. So yeah, it's so yeah. funny. Everyone has like a di- I thought everybody had pretty much like the same sort of thing, but so many different people like different ones. It's funny when it comes to music, everyone is different. It yeah, because really there was a couple of them that I didn't want to go on that album, and I was like, look, I'd rather than you know be left off. But some of them, that's people's favourites. <laughs> oh, so, just as well they're there then. Yeah, so I'm not going to say which ones. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it's better not to because yeah. like, oh, I wonder why if you weren't musical theatre is there anything that you would like to be doing well no I, d- I don't want to just do musical theatre anyway because c- I'm an actress really f- yeah. foremost so uh love to be doing sitcoms blah 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 but you know I love singing as well so just singing a good old pop song would be good <laughs> if someone said you've got to choose one path and that's it what would you do apart from panic and run away <laughs> which, is, um, which is the obvious answer to that question, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I can't choose. That's like saying All choose between my cats, I can't do it. How many cats have you got? Two. That's why I just can't choose. Right. I'm not allowed. Well, that's fine. What kind of music do you yourself listen to then? Uh well, everything. I just have such a wide collection of music. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I like folky music, because I was brought up on that, really. Mother's Irish, so, uh, yeah, I like, I like folk music, and um, I like really camp chart music. <laughs> That's just a dance around, too. <laughs> There's a lot of that about as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no shortage. No, not really camp. I oh, know, it sounds awful now. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I like, I like a wide collection of things, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Going to go back to sort of um, talking about additions and stuff, and I know you said that the Avenue Q edition was hard. Is that the worst edition you've ever had? Or is there one where you just thought, get me out of here? Oh, I've had plenty where I thought, get me out of here. Probably, probably the ones I really didn't get as well. <laughs> where I've just been singing and gone uh, cracked on a note or something and just thought oh please <laughs> any in particular that stand out? actually there was one audition where I sang um, Climbing Up Hill from the last five years uh-huh. and as you know it's a very funny song Yeah. and this guy I can't even remember what the audition was for but this old man was auditioning me for something and um, I did the song and he just looked up and went right <laughs> that was it just like nothing so I went well I thought that was quite funny but oh <laughs> and he just oh, no. wasn't he wasn't biting at all so I was like okay and then he went can you tap dance <laughs> and I went well I've no Fred Astaire but and he went okay <laughs> I was like shall I go or yeah Right, okay. It was just really weird. I just left both thinking, and he hated me. <laughs> I think he just hated his life, really. That's not good. No. He wasn't a very good audience member. <laughs> he doesn't sound it. No. There's not, I suppose there's nothing worse than sort of standing and thinking that you're getting something spot on and having it absolutely fall flat. It's like being a comedian and absolutely no one laughing at your jokes. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like doing sort of things with a lot of comic timing in them? Do you find that? Yeah, I love comedy. I suppose you've got a lot to play with in Avenue Q with that. Oh, yeah, I love it. Do you have a favourite part of the show? Act one. (laughs) It all goes by so fast, really. (laughs) Um, But act one's my favourite. Avenue Q's closing. How do you feel about being part of that, sort of the closing cast? Is that quite difficult, seeing as you opened it? Well, no, I mean, that was part of the reason that... um, I, well, that was the reason I came back to close it, really, because I wanted to be... It, it, it's just something nice about opening it and closing it as well. Because, yeah, uh, yeah it's, Avenue Q's a massive part of my life. It's just so lovely to, you know, work with everyone from the beginning and, and now to close it as well. I think it's, it's really nice. It's sad, though. It's sad it's closing. Yeah. Do you have anything planned for after Avenue Q, or is that something Not you yet. think about... 
later? Not yet. Don't know yet. Uh, yeah. Scared. <laughs> I suppose that is the, the daunting thing, particularly at the moment, with, with shows, a lot of shows. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like that anyway, though. Life of no. an actress, that's what it's like. It's just, you, yeah. you just never know. I know you're tight for time, so thank you very much for oh, thank um, you. talking to us tonight. I'm actually coming to see the show in two weeks, so I'm looking forward to that. Oh. I hope we have a good show tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, see you All soon. Right. Bye. Bye. Musical Talk. Tom, you're going to talk about Spring Awakening now. Yes. Which um, you saw last night. I did see last night. Spring Awakening, I got to admit, on the whole, I was. Now, I'm. I have to admit, I am slightly biased because when Spring Awakening, this musical rendition was first done in New York, it was actually, I think it was commissioned or co produced by the Atlantic Theatre Company, which is who I trained with as an actor out there in, in the US of A. So, on the whole, it was very good. I like it almost on a. Uh, on a moral scale. no on a on a moral point that it's not a big musical it's you know but it is in the sense that clearly a lot of thought has gone into the design and the staging but it's not about revolving stages it's not about oh my god that car just flew or that person's flying it's you know it's not about it's that not it's not magical it's not well but there you go but it's it's because the magic is in the story mm-hmm. it's not in the props and the the set designer you know um, you know, designing something that can fly but can only be done in a few theatres or whatever. The stage hardly ever changed. The only set that was really brought on and off were chairs to show you where the new building or the new house or the new room, whatever, wherever they were, they'd bring cha- appropriate chairs on to display the classroom or whatnot. And um, the two older actors played all the older characters and uh, they had a cast of a lot of newbies, a lot of people who came from like the National Youth Theatre and like uh, National Musical Youth Theatre, I think as well, something like that. And they were all very good. It was actually, it was one of the best cast shows I've seen in a very long time. Like the, I wouldn't have made any, you know, if I was the casting director for that, I would have hopefully made exactly the same choice. It was cast very well. Very well, and the, all you, the actors did a very good job. Do you think it was cast well because it was... I mean, the characters in the story are young anyway. Yes. Yeah. So they're not going to go for casting 35-year-olds playing... But no, but they would. They would. It happens a lot because, because they are trustworthy actors. You know they'll get the job done. So you always cast an actor who is in their 20s or something and has a track record that proves they're worth their money, and they just look younger. That That happens a lot. And here I think they have actually gone out on a limb and said we're going to cast... All these, all these teenagers to play. Do you think that worked? Oh yeah, I think it was very good. I think it was very good because actually, there's one moment at the end of Act One. I'm not going to say, but those of you who've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. At the end of Act One, um, where I was a bit uncomfortable when it happened because the actors are so young, right? And I'm there thinking, I, I'm not sure if this is appropriate. You know, if if they were older actors, you know, oh, you're leafing through the 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 program and you see they trained at this place and then they've clearly been acting for years and years you kind of go okay it's okay it's okay they're masturbating it's it's okay well then they're not they're not masturbating on stage um it's something else that happens it and actually the fact that they are young and i'm aware of it makes it shocking and i kind of go do you think oh yeah exactly and i think that's why it's good casting because the, the actors can carry these characters who have a lot of depth they're not simple and then you have those moments like that at the end of Act One that you, I, I actually, and I was in the front row as well, so I felt I was really, I could see all the stuff that was going on. And I was thinking, yeah, that's, that's that look somewhere else, Tom. That's quite inappropriate. Put your you know? program front of your face. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So the end of Act One, you were really happy. Yes, the end of Act. I've, I actually, um, it's, it's, it's very interesting because Nick talked about this earlier when he's saying about Oliver. Some of the dance sequences, you know, it's not, it's not a big musical cast. It's not a big cast. I'm think, gosh. Probably, like Oliver, where it's eighty. No, I th- I think you're looking at a cast, including the the swing actors. You're looking at maybe a cast of fifteen total. It's not bad though. It's enough. It's it's enough, and for a stage like the Lyric, it's perfect. It's you know, it's um, not a small theatre, is it? The Lyric. No, but it's a but it, but it's not. Well, it's exactly. It's not quite fringe. It's it's whatever off West End or whatever they call. I don't know. It's like you've got. Yeah, that's a whole another it's kettle of fish. End. Yeah, um, but it's no, it's it's a great. I the lyric theatre in Hammersmith is one of my favourite theatres in the world. I think it's a great theatre, and they put on a lot of 
really high quality daring programs there. But being in the front row, there are a couple of dance sequences, and I'm thinking of one in particular in the first act. There was a dance sequence during the song "The Bitch of Living," where I thought if I was further back, I'd really be enjoying this dance sequence. Interesting song to dance to. Yeah, the bitch of Link is actually that's the other thing. I thought the the first act was actually stronger than the second act. Normally, normally, especially with plays like you say, the second act has the drama, it has the action, it has the you know all the everything. You build everything up in the first act, so in the second act, it can all collapse. Yeah. And although they did this, although they did that, you know, um, I actually enjoyed the first act quite a bit more than I did the second act. Partly that's because I think it had better songs in the first act. I really enjoyed the opening four or five songs in the first act. I, I thought they were done really well, and it kind of it set the tone right. That brought a smile to my face, and I kind of went, "Okay, I'm I'm geared up for seeing this show." But you like your rock music, so... I do, I do, I do. At times... Was it turgid, depressing rock, or whiny, that kind of, you know... No, 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 I tell you, uh, it's, it's kind of, a trick. Was it kind of punky, or...? It was, it was a bit punky, but it kind of... It didn't, it didn't just pigeonhole itself into one. But then in the second act, I, I felt that the songs were a little bit samey. Mm-hmm. But that's because of how it paralleled the script. You see, this is, this is my... And it's not, a crit, it's, not a, it's not a big critique because I can see why they've done it this way. And it makes sense why they've done it this way. You know, it's based on a very old play. And so when they're dialoguing, the script is very concise and traditional and very clever in that sense. And then when they start to sing, you know, you get you get transported to America, and you know, and it's, it sounds American. Clearly, it's written. But, but what you're seeing here, correct me if I'm wrong, is you're seeing these actors put on this traditional play, and then they get their microphones out and they sing their thoughts, their modern day thoughts on the play. Is that right? Oh yeah, no, that would make sense. I actually didn't see that because um, I didn't that see would that. Explain the different language styles and the different. Yeah, that would explain it. But actually, that didn't. Th- I, that didn't come across didn't in the jump show. Out to you no, as, as a not at all, not at all. And I mean, that's a concept that's done a lot in the theatre. Well, well, not just that, but I mean, I've, you know, I've got a show going on at the uh, upstairs at the Gatehouse this February called uh, Once a Catholic. Come see it; it's going to be good. And that's what we're doing. In you know, Once a Catholic is a group of schoolgirls come back and act out the sh- the play. So it's a play within a play. And I didn't actually see that. I just, I, I personally thought when they pulled out the microphones and started singing. Uh, it's just quite a cool way to say, look, we don't have to be, I'm going to, you know, put a microphone, a Britney-like microphone or something in the forehead. I've got to try and disguise. It's like, we know that it's a theatre. We know that they're singing. We know that they have to sing in to, you know, to get it to the speakers so everyone can hear it. So why try and hide it? Why bother trying to hide these devices? And I, I agree, it was very refreshing <laughs> for them to do that and refreshing for them to go like, no, we're just going to bring on chairs and we move the chairs to change the angles to show you that we're now at home. You know, it's, we don't have to have a massive set change and, you know, th- the set collapses and reveals this massive thing which 40 people push on, you know. It's, what was the audience reaction last night? The audience, well, this is going back to what I was saying about it suddenly becomes quite American. I think the audience was quite American as well. Um, it's something that's happened in Wicked every time I've seen Wicked, either, you know, in an, on Broadway or here, is when the actors came on... The audience, you know, so it's, by the way, it's sold out audiences at the Lyric. You know, that's why I'm pretty sure it'll go to the West End. But the second the actors walked on, people cheered. And I personally, I think that's a very American thing to do. I don't think that happens a lot when you see very British audiences seeing shows. And by British, I don't mean just British audience who go to see shows in the West End and they're sort of the middle to upper class. I'm talking about, you know, seeing shows at Hackney Empire and Arcola and other venues that have British audiences from different backgrounds to the middle class that go see the West End shows. Well, Atkinson got a cheer when he came on in Oliver, but that's expected, I think. Well, I mean, it's just, I I remember Michael Sheen famously, because I saw him in Frost Nixon, and his, you know, he loves Frost Nixon, he loves the character, and he loved doing it, but one of his biggest complaints was he said, in America they're very different, because I would walk on stage, the first time I walk on stage, and they'd all cheer. You know, Frank Langella, same thing, he'd walk on stage, they'd all cheer. And he said it was annoying, it was distracting, because you spend hours in rehearsal getting the rhythm right of a show, and you do. You spend hours getting it right, think about your character, and then you come on stage and you've got to wait for them to stop cheering. It, I, and you think, I haven't done anything yet. And that's what I thought when I was watching Spring Awakening. I thought, I'm not going to cheer for these people, because quite frankly, they just walked. 
That's I can do that. all they did. I can do that. Everyone in this theatre can do that, you know. That actually kind of turned me off a little bit because I thought, oh, now it's going to be kind of playing to an American audience. And truth be told, it got um, two curtain calls and a standing evasion. Um, and, I, you know, they, they, they had done a very good job, but I, I think it was... Uh, the American influence that For said me, come like you, you didn't stand up at the standing. No, no, I, I, no. Oh, okay. They deserved, they deserved a standing ovation. They definitely did, but the two curtain calls is a bit much. In fact, the actors with the last one, a lot of them, or, or about two thirds of them, came on, and then the other third obviously ran on because they weren't used to getting the second one or, or something like that. <laughs> the production element of it was really good. It was a kind of a show that knew what it was. I thought the first act was was stronger than the second act, and the songs of the first act were better, and the script in the first act was strong. I it was just it was stronger first act, and the second act, like you said, it was actually. You kind of said the second act was sort of suddenly smothered in treacle, really. Well, no, no, because a lot of the drama did happen, but then at the end, it resolved itself. Well, no, th- th- there's the final song. Uh, let me just say it for you here. It's got the song of Purple Summer. Um, hey by the the, the the entire company sings that song and actually for my taste I think it could have ended before that song started and it would have been a very powerful very poignant ending but instead then they launch into this one number which kind of slots in there and, and I thought to myself what they're trying to do is give us a nice tidy bow to tie all these problems of this era and, and how it affects us now you know they're trying to make it really nice and packaged almost spoon feed us and I think that from for me, for a lot of the musicals I've seen come out of America in the 21st century, that's a very American thing to do. Whereas actually, it would have it would take a lot more guts to kind of say, you know what, the ending is is a bit tragic, and we're going to leave you with that, so that you can think about what what's happened, as opposed to us trying to do the thinking for you on stage, so that you can kind of go away and think, oh, what a happy musical, I'm going to go so buy more tickets. You're talking, you said they tagged a happy ending onto it, or they well, it's not, it's not a happy ending, but it's, the loose they, ends. yeah, they were trying, they were really trying to package it really nicely, like nice little bow in it. And you know, it's actually, it's I find it's a mistake, it's a common mistake that a lot of not just musicals, but a lot of plays make. You know, I saw a show at the National called um, Her Naked Skin last year. That's 2008. Biggity. And that's what they did. They had one scene too many at the end. And, uh, I th- you know, it, I think there's quite a lot of bra- bravery to go, let's cut that scene and just give them this ending, which is more complex, but does more justice to the show. You know. Here we go with my weekly mention. Wicked could do that. They could cut the bit where she... You know the ending. Yeah, the ending. Yeah, in case. In ca- actually, is uh, do we have any listeners who haven't seen Wicked? I tell you, if you're a listener, I think we have listeners who choose not to see Wicked. Okay, all right, who choose not to see? But that kind of that's an active thing. I I would like if someone could email me dharmatmusicaltalk.co.uk. Just, just someone email him. Yeah, someone, someone, anyone. No, no. But if someone to email me dharmatmusicaltalk.co.uk with Wicked in the uh, subject bar and just to say. Dom, hello. I like you a lot because that's always nice to hear. But to say I've never seen Wicked, it's not by choice. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. I would, I would be amazed if one of our listeners has done that, or five of our listeners. If I get five of them, I'll, Dom will eat his hat. I'll eat my hat live on this show with audio and everything. With audio and everything, yeah. They could just not have that ending or Little Trip of Horrors, the the film version. They could not have it all mm-hmm. be happy. Yeah. I don't know why Hollywood have to do this. And why... Exactly, and it's kind of an American thing, but because, like you say, because Hollywood's done it, American audiences kind of anticipate it, and they like you can't give them a really difficult ending. But then you look at a sh- one of my favourite musicals of all time, West Side Story, and that is one of the best endings to a story ever. Or Phantom. It, it's Exactly. It's, it's done, it knows what the story is, and it's true to how the story should end. You know, it doesn't try and indulge... Phantom left away for a sequel. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, it doesn't... Well, Spring Awakening, it kind of... I think that that final song about Purple Summer, which I still don't know what a Purple Summer is. I'll look at the lyrics again and try and figure it out. But I think it kind of indulges... I still think the, it's Prince-related. Well, uh, well, I think it just indulges the audience a bit. And I think, actually, we're, we're a smart audience because it's quite a complex play that it's this, this musical's based on. So you don't have to indulge us for that last song. Yeah, but all in all, all in all, I'd say it's worth seeing. It, it's really worth seeing, especially if you're looking for a high, a sort of a production of artistic music. No, 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 but that's why. Especially if you're looking for an, a production of artistic excellence where the most expensive seats are £27.50. 
and you're seeing uh, the quality of show is the same that you'd see in the West End. Wasn't it a ten pound free for all though? Uh, no, I saw I saw that when I when I saw it, it was the last day of the ten pound tickets, okay. and so as of Monday, they were all they all went into. Uh, different prices i think maybe the previews were over or something but yeah normally and that's why i love the lyric as well the lyric a lot of their shows they try and get a lot of sponsorship so that they can keep their ticket prices low and they they put a lot of shows on where it's nine pounds and it that's for every seat in the house so you spend nine pounds and if you get there early enough you get the front row of the stores it's a story gripping it is. It's, you know what it's a very good story which is why in the second act the songs i didn't think sort of way yeah, well, well, I'm not just, but I think that's why they started to sound samey because they they tried to take over the story, whereas actually it's it's a very gripping and and difficult exploration. You know, it's Spring Awakening. It's about these teens in a repressed society discovering their sexual nature and how it's meant to be. Um, the other, yes, there's no, there is also a, in my head a it's not High School Musical. Um, yeah, but not again, not as not as glossy. Um, but there's no, there is one bit in the second act which I, I don't want to ruin, but it's a moment between two of the students that is very comedic. And for those of you who see it, again, do email me or we'll talk about it again if, if we get enough demand. Um, I don't think it should have been comedic. I think they glossed over that moment. And when they did that, I lost a bit of interest in the story because I thought, you again, you could have been grittier. The first act, you're preparing me for something gritty. And I understand that it's getting darker in the second act, so you think, I've got to give you levity. But I think the levity came at the wrong point with these two characters. Turn the lights up a bit more. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, so if you do see the show, um, you might disagree with me. And I, you know, well, if you have seen the show. If you, or if you, yes, exactly. If you haven't seen the show, I you'll what, know which two characters I'm talking about the, and the two schoolboys. I wonder what differences there are between Broadway and the West End. I think so. I think there there must have been some adaptation. I think there there must have been because they, you know, they can't just give the same show when they know they've got a different because, audience. Because this isn't someone doing the West End yeah. Broadway. This and is also, the Broadway production. Yes, in... but and the but you're talking about actors who are English. Mm -hmm. You know, on the whole, I think English, or the they're from the UK. Yeah, so they've got to get their, their their tongue around it. I also saw earlier this year um, at the National. August Osage County, which is Steppenwolf, so a famous Chicago-based American theatre company, come over and do an American show, very American. It was the heartland of America, and it was brilliant. That's actually the second show I've seen this year, which got a standing ovation, and deservedly so, one of the best plays I've seen at the National. That show wasn't too American, even though it was about America, but I guess because the company's American, we, going in there, accepted that. Whereas this one, they've got an English, English, uh, sorry, Engl well, English audience, and uh, I'm sure international audience as well for Spring Awakening, and an English cast, so they must have adjusted it in some way to go, well, we can't just carbon copy it because that it's a different and also audience. Also, they've, they've probably thought of ways to improve the song, yeah, improve yeah. the book and lyrics. Or, or just even not improve, but kind of go, well, let's try this out, see how it goes, you know. Um, but the, the onstage band and the... Uh, the uh, I'm, I'm not sure if conductor's the right word for it, but all, they were all brilliant, mm -hmm. actually. Truth be told, and the fact that you can see them the whole way through it, they're great. Again, saying your theory that it, it's this, a show. this is a show. It's a show. It's just, it's, it's a show. And, and since you mentioned the school thing, I can see why they've made a lot of design choices now, but it wasn't obvious to me when I saw it. Yeah. I don't right. change your opinion on it. Yeah, no, it, it actually, it, it, that does make uh, quite a bit of sense. Like, like I say, it's, it's well worth seeing, especially if you were in the mood for something a bit different but still with the same quality of spending a lot of money in the West End. And one last question to close this discussion. Go for it. How does it compare to our old favourite Rent? Oh, it, I'm very sorry if you are fans of Rent. It, it knocks Rent out of the ballpark easily. I'm just sorry easily. if you're a fan of Rent in general. <laughs> yeah, I, I apologise. You know, oh, poor, poor people. But um, no, it knocks Rent out of the ballpark because I was concerned. I, before going in there, I was thinking, oh man, what if it's just like a new Rent? Because uh, it's kind of American rock amidst a, a difficult time teenagers and, and, uh, with teenagers and actually in the second act I, I started to see it but no it was, I think it's well worth seeing it's well worth seeing I was glad I got to see it especially for £10 yeah, it's always good especially oh. in these dark times especially in the air there is well there's no recession enough. do you want to see any other musicals appearing in the West End? no none whatsoever in fact okay. this is my last episode for musical talk no I do I do want to see I do want to see quite a few musicals in fact I have still yet to see Hairspray live I saw that and exactly a lot of people have and I'm I'm desperate I've, to go see it I just I've never laughed 
so yeah, much. Yeah, I, I, I really want to go see Hairspray. It's the one that's been open for, gosh, what, a year and a half now? It's not a so, belly laugh show in, in its entirety, but yeah. the, in the one song where it's Michael Ball doing a duet with his wife, with yes. his husband. With his husband, yeah. Michael Ball as a female character. Yes. It's you hysterical. need to bring an oxygen mask yeah. because you're... well I do I mean I have seen the film and I loved it and I think the music's great in the film and so to see th- it's so much better on well space, that's why and, but I was thinking when I was watching that to see those dancers live mm. they're so energetic that you can't help be carried away by them so that's my objective what, is to see Hairspray this year what really works well for me in, in this song is okay all the dance numbers are great and the upbeat mm. stuff but the the gospel number I know where I've been didn't do anything for me in the film. Yes. But when I saw it on stage for the first time, it was one of the most powerful Interesting. things. Very I, interesting. Because I, I, I agree, in the film, it didn't do that much for me either. But um, I mean, that song, people started clapping before she finished her last... Before because she, it was so good. Yeah. Really, you know, it's yeah. that powerful. Yeah. And it, everything has been so upbeat. It's what the show needs to bring it To bring it, make home. it real. Yeah, bring, bring it, it home. home. Yeah. Um, so, um, the same question to you, Nick. Are, are you um, looking forward to any shows that you haven't seen before well, this ne- year? Well, next week we're going to be talking about 2009 and 2008. And the, uh, uh, Sister Act um, oh, yes. has a resounding... Um, I th- we think it's going to be the big show of the summer. I think so, too. I've got a couple of friends who auditioned for that as well. So, I've got to say it's going to be a good show. Yeah. If they get it. They get and my mate did the music, so it's all... It's, it, it's all incestuous. Yeah, it's horrible. It's all yeah. very good. Yeah, um, it's Sister Act. No, that's one to look out for, true. Yeah, and the cast has been announced for that the interesting the, the palladium is a is a not a difficult venue but a, a one of an interesting choice i think mm-hmm. because it's big it's very big <laughs> be interesting to see how what it does there mm-hmm. i'm not hugely looking forward to priscilla which opens in march um, see i i am did, did you not like the film i've never seen the film i think she the film would i enjoy it's, it i think i honestly i i we think should go the, well i think i think watch do watch the film first i think because it, it's a great film in in its tongue in cheek way, okay, and it's very clever. It's a very clever film, and it's 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 quite touching. So and they say this will be the most spectacular musical ever, as, as regards it, it most, silly al- costumes. Almost, yeah, almost like saying it's going to be the most fabulous yeah. movie ever, yeah, uh, fabulous. musical ever. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, mostly girls, probably. Thank you very much for listening. Let's not make that judgment on our listeners. <laughs> you know, two very handsome male presenters, two straight. Oh yeah, uh, you know, I hadn't seen it that way. Yes, thank you very much, ladies. <laughs> Yes, um, and, uh, we'll, well, thank you very much, and we'll talk to you next week. Yes, ta-ta. This has been a production of Musical Talk, copyright 2009. We should, we're going we off to a gala evening now. We should, and no, have we champagne, should make a move. We should make a move. Champagne and canopies. Yeah. Who's <laughs> Dovis? Yeah. And here are some musical out talks. Welcome back. No. Bibbidi bobbidi bibbidi bobbidi boo. What um? So what are we going to talk about? Spring awakening, Sp- Oliver. Spring awakening, Anne Oliver. Um, are you gonna you are you gonna segue to the appropriate stuff? Yeah. There. I mean, because do you want me to ask? Uh, Hello, Jonathan. Hello. Well, hello. Welcome to this week's episode of Musical Talk. I'm uh, <laughs> blah 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 blah. Mm-hmm. Outtakes. <laughs> Um, but well, yeah, because what I was going to say, are there any questions in particular you want me to ask you about Oliver? Because um, no, we'll just talk about it, you know. Um, <laughs> because it's it literally it'll just be me going. So how was it? And then you talk about yeah. it, and I'll do the same for you. But, <laughs> oh god! Um, <laughs> but I mean, keep it short because we have a whole interview. Yeah, I'm things. thinking like ten minutes, yeah, both of them, like five each. each. We'll do a game. <laughs> yeah. so everything you can about Spring Awakening. I'm going to go. Yeah, in fact, I mean, how much time do we... Well, it's, no, we've got plenty of time to yeah, do this okay. anyway. Because um, I think if we if we make a move... On anyone. At, I, yeah, they'll kill us. Now, if, if we leave here, like, say, seven, or a little bit after seven, we'll get there for eight, I think. Mm-hmm. No, but have you actually... Do you know if the district line's running? This, You know, the, you know they have weekend line closures. Do you know if the district line's affected by that on this week? I forgot to check. Completely forgot to check. Hello... Love will keep us together. <laughs> Outtakes over. Let's head to a musical talk extra for this week. In episode 90, you may remember Tim Sayward spoke to the Canadian composer of musicals Mel Atkey. He has a documentary about his life story. This is 
Finding My Voice. In 2004, Olivier Award winning actress Janie D presented a critically acclaimed sell out one woman show at London's Pizza on the Park. I'm supposed to be who I chose to be Somehow One should never be All alone As an opening number, she asked me to adapt my song Something in the Air. What a happy glow Thank you all for coming here Should be quite a show An electric atmosphere And you're all my friends what a great exciting... Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This program is the first in a series about the wonders of space. Your hosts will be the Apke family. Yes, Dad, I'm sure everyone will enjoy our adventure. When I was a child, the principal of my elementary school brought me a microscope. Because I wrote science fiction stories, he thought I was interested in science. But the truth was, I didn't want to grow up to be Stephen Hawking. I wanted to be Captain Kirk. We have to prepare for blast off. Okay. Countdown, start your countdown. Five, four, three, two, one, zero, blast off. While there were stars in my eyes, there were also tunes in my head. Fast forward to 30 years later. In a small theater in the heart of Manhattan, I made my New York theatrical debut as a composer and lyricist. How did I get there? Ladner, British Columbia, where I grew up, was 3,000 miles away from Broadway, and certainly nothing in my upbringing encouraged me toward the Big Apple. But everything sang to me. As I walked home from school, or more likely ran home, escaping some ten-year-old fascist with a pea shooter, my mind built to a crescendo of the Hallelujah Chorus, even if I was unable to make the world outside hear it. The first inkling that I might have musical ability came when a friend of my grandmother's helped me to write out a song that was then presented to universal acclaim in front of my grade 7 class. Things remained quiet on the musical front while I concentrated on my political struggle with the school principal, who had somewhat ludicrously claimed that human beings were at the top of the animal kingdom. This would come back to haunt me in future years when I would attempt to mount my first theatrical opus on school grounds. In high school, I gravitated toward the school drama department with aspirations of being an actor. Blessed with a physique that resembled an arthritic coat rack and the breaking voice of a tone-deaf hyena, I was uniquely unsuited to principal roles in the school musicals. In Kiss Me Kate, I played the stage doorkeeper with one line. I turned to the music program and began to concoct a rock opera with the cheerful title David, A Young Boy's Shattered Dreams, only the score was still in my head. I was approached by some of the senior music students who had heard about my idea. They seemed interested, and I hoped that they would help me. But in fact, they were just fascinated by the concept of a rock opera with no music. That did it. I was going to crack this problem, so I signed up for a class in music theory, in spite of the fact that I could not play any instrument proficiently. This was a highly disciplined environment. The other students were serious, accomplished musicians, and I aspired to their level of creativity. Alas, 
my hidden talents would remain hidden for a few years yet. But I discovered a fellow spirit, a classmate named Mark Telford. He and I stayed after school talking grandiose schemes. A musical. Of Macbeth. Uh, a group of friends of mine and I have formed a comedy group. A comedy group? Yeah, uh -huh. for satire. I see. And uh, we call it the National Film Bore of Canada. Uh huh. Okay. And uh, we. Sounds, sounds like you got a good start already. Yeah. Um. We've produced one radio play called Macbeth. With soft shoe dancing witches and a porter in blackface. This was the show that would make Max Bielestock break out in goose pimples. And uh, we're going to try to work on staging it this Christmas. Wow. Did you have uh, pretty good success with it? Was it pretty well accepted when you put it on the air? Uh, I have not on the, on the air yet. Oh, I see. You're, you're just going to do it. The station's lost the tape. <laughs> they did? Oh, that's terrible. Uh, you uh, only had one tape? I made the mistake of not sending a registered mail. Yes. And I know it was received, but I don't know who received it. Oh, wow. I sent it to the program director, and I found out they don't have one. So we set to work. But then we hit an obstacle, and I suddenly wished that I had never persuaded the school board to scuttle the principal's plan to rename our school after the neighboring Indian tribe who used to rape and pillage our own Indians. Well, you, what are you doing? He banned all of our activities, and we were forced underground. Rehearsals began under the same tight discipline that I had learned in musicianship class. Somehow we pulled it off. On Vancouver Cooperative Radio, it's 7:30. We're going into now the Drama Festival tonight. A special pr production of Macbeth. Macbeth is the story of one man's quest for power and the manner in which he is encouraged by his steadfast and unrelenting wife. Macbeth greets three weird sisters, and following a brief love affair between one of the sisters and and Banquet, Macbeth's partner, Macbeth is told that he will soon become king. He sends word home to Lady Macbeth to inform her of the good news. She promptly, promptly writes back to him and asks him what time he would be home for dinner and whether or not to put on the tea. To us, it sounded like, but the audience heard. I got the last laugh many years later when I discovered a book called Everything Baseball. In it, there's a list of song titles found in the Library of Congress. Among them was the baseball song, sung by the three witches to Macbeth and Banquo. Don't ask why there was a baseball scene in the opening of Macbeth, and don't ask how it found its way into a book published by Prentice Hall. Just accept it. Yay, team! After I graduated from high school, I tried to persuade Mark to continue to write with me, but he wasn't interested. I was left to spin my wheels. There was a bug inside me that didn't know how to get out. It had never really occurred to me at this point that I might be able to write music. While there were tunes in my head, I thought they were destined to stay there. So I turned to producing. A mutual friend introduced me to a Swiss-born airline upholsterer named Willy German, known locally as the patron saint of jazz musicians. We put together a concert featuring pianist Mike Taylor and legendary bass player Wyatt Ruther. This was supposed to be a fundraiser for youth theatre. In fact, it raised $700 to the ground. The experience was worth it, though, and years later would inspire my musical Poor Little Rich Girl Sings the Blues. I'm sure to miss your funny faces But I won't cry if I do Cause there's no use getting sad to me 
Then I put together a telethon for a local charity, with Vancouver folk star Tom Northcott as the headline act. Ninety degrees in the trees where it's shady, a hundred and ten in the hot sun. Heat from the street burns the feet of the ladies, see how they run. I had begun what I realize now was the study of my craft. I got a job with a local radio station as a theater critic and began to interview some of those who'd influenced me, including Godspell composer Stephen Schwartz. There's a kind of group energy generated by actors when they're on the stage all the time. In, in uh, working, though, we weren't able to do this for some technical reasons in the New York production. I always am. I always like to have the entire cast on the stage the entire time watching uh, the other monologues if they're not directly involved themselves. Actor Reed Shelton played Daddy Warbucks in the original Broadway production of Annie. We opened in Washington, D.C., and the scenery was not painted. Now, had we fopped, they would have saved $150,000. Now, what Roger Stevens had to see is if the show was really going to make it. He came back in intermission, our opening night in Washington, said, paint the scenery. Vancouver singer and songwriter Anne Mortify. How do you, when you're writing, sense the difference between where something should be stated with words and where it should be stated with music? Oh, that's really interesting. I mean, you're asking the great metaphysical question. (laughs) I don't write these things. (laughs) I merely am here. And it's a sense. It's an instinct. It's, um, you, you, you just find out what it wants to be. I can't, I mean, it, it sounds so nebulous, but uh, it's almost like th- this little Japanese thing that I once heard that said that there was this great master who created perfect elephants. They were the essence of elephants. And he had an apprentice who apprenticed with him for 10 years. And one day he finally said, Master, I, can't, I cannot comprehend how you get the elephants to be so perfect. How do you do it? Tell me your secret. And he said, well, it's simple. I, I take a block of stone and I carve away everything that is not elephant. So that's what I did. I set about carving away everything that was not elephant. Although I was not actually a student there, I joined the University of British Columbia's Musical Theatre Society, a group whose alumni had included actress Margot Kidder, who had made her acting debut on their stage a couple of decades earlier. Mussock's mainstay was flaming-haired choreographer Grace McDonald, who had taught some of Broadway's best dancers. There's been some major stars in Canadian theatre that have made their beginnings with Mussock. Who were some of them? Well, I, I think that Miller Andrews is well known in opera circles in uh, Covent Garden and Santa Wells, and Kelvin Service, who is still probably doing quite a lot of the scene down south. But then of the part, maybe the contemporary area, it's probably uh, Brent Carver, New Bruce Nichols, uh, uh, you know, you can go on and, and on and on, and practically everybody in town that's to do with theater started at least on the stage here. In their production of Anything Goes, I played... The name is Henry T. Dobson, DC, AC, LLG, moderator of the Chinese Anglican Church, President Emeritus of the Foreign Missionary Societies of the World, Honorary Chaplain of the Army of the Chinese Republic, author, lecturer, President of the Westminster Conference. But this part required me to move. Grace had a talent for taking somebody like me with two left feet and making him look presentable, if not exactly Fred Astaire. Through Mussock, I was introduced to the world of dancers and musical theater performers. I am 17 years old. Oh, I have one of those good old mothers who put me to I started dancing dance. when I was and then after 13. That, like, I actually 13. I because I just love people. I, people so I just finished doing the I started my training with them. I the 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 From her, I went to Marina. I felt the energy, and it added syncopation to the pulse that was already beating inside me. Then an idea began to percolate. As a child, I was given a toy tiger. My father made up bedtime stories about this tiger and named him Frady Cat. With help from a friend who had traveled extensively throughout India, I developed a story about a group of tigers who had organized an army to defend themselves against the Shikara, or tiger hunters. The script generated a lot of excitement, 
and the same New York agency who represented Stephen Sondheim were interested in taking me on. But still, there was no music. At least not on paper. It was still locked in my head. The frustration was palpable. Then one afternoon I went over to a friend's house. He was listening to Stravinsky's Rite of Spring on his stereo and following the score. While I knew where all the notes were on the staff, I had never been able to count time properly, to understand note values and syncopation. Rite of Spring's time signatures were so complex that the choreographer Nijinsky was reduced to counting the time out loud from the wings to his ballet russe corps. Yet as I followed through the score, something crystallized. That night, as I lay in bed, about to go to sleep, I mentally heard one of my tunes and could visualize the score in front of me. I wrote down what I saw. A few weeks later we went into a recording studio and within a couple of months that same song was played nationally on CBC Radio. Two at CI Radio. Some people can just struggle for years and years to uh, make their mark in the entertainment world, but some have it. And uh, there's a young fellow by the name of Mel Atke who has it. Atke has been writing a musical with uh, a character nicknamed Freddy Cat in the main role. And uh, I have a song I'd like to feature from that uh, musical right now. It's sung by Janice, or Janice actually, Jode. Now, this is Ralph Lucas, CFQR Radio Montreal. I just wanted to say we have indeed added to our playlist Far Away. I just want to like to know. that we are doing your song, Tigress, here in Chicago at WTM. I'm going to try a new song here by a local girl, actually a girl who grew up in Kelowna, and now recording, making a professional debut, hometown girl named Janice Joe here. The dam had broken. The theatrical potential of this highly visual piece was obvious. A number of directors became interested in staging Shikara, and Stephen Schwartz told me that I showed enormous promise as a theatre composer, adding, Lucky you, such talent is rarer than you know. But then a new musical opened in London called Cats. Suddenly the idea of feline characters dancing on stage did not seem so original. But still, I had arrived, so I thought, and set out to conquer the big bad world of musical theatre. I set out for Toronto, Canada's cultural capital, and the world's third largest English-speaking theatre centre, behind London and New York. Until the early 1980s, Toronto had a strong cabaret scene. A topical musical review called Toronto Toronto had been pulling in dinner theatre audiences for a couple of years, but I arrived just as the dinner theatres were closing. There was a branch of the famous Lehman Engel Musical Theatre Workshop there, but Lehman had died just a few months earlier and the workshop struggled on without him. Although I was a little fish in a big pond, I expected to rise quickly to the top. Of course, when a fish does that, it's not a good omen. Still, there were hopeful signs on the horizon. I was commissioned by CBC Radio to write four songs as a pilot for a proposed musical set in a recording studio called Closed Session. However, in the workshops my work was not embraced as enthusiastically as I had imagined it would be. I had many lessons to learn. For one thing, rhymes had to be perfect. No more rhyming find with mine. 
As an act of rebellion, the next song I wrote contained almost no rhymes. I'll be going where the mood will take me And I'm hoping maybe you will come along And you will be with me on my grand adventure And we'll rediscover forgotten treasures We'll open vistas in our tired minds And we will pay the price to find our freedom With our lives While I was strong on romantic ballads, I had not mastered the sophisticated comedy number but I was determined that I would. If Romeo spying his Juliet's light should never have known what to say, she'd go to her bedroom and call it a night, and there'd be the end of the play. If Cyrano writing his letters so fine for Christian to give to Roxanne had never been able to think of a line She'd never have followed their plan. Then a friend introduced me to Kate, a one-time actress who had become a talent agent. I was wanting to write a small show, but I felt that it had to be something that wasn't a big show scaled down, but something that demanded to be small. The, the best way to do it was to write something that dwelt on one character exposing himself and that, that somehow he had to be under the gun to do it. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, just in one flash, it came an audition for heaven, and it will be called the grand finale. For the first time, my passion for musicals and my fondness for science fiction coincided when James Doohan arrived, handing out beam me up Scotty fridge magnets and regaling us with Celtic folk songs and stories of life aboard the Starship Enterprise. The uh, first Star Trek movie, which cost forty-two million dollars, on the getting when we're getting to Viger, Ilya. You know, was by that time a robot. The scene that I wanted them to keep in was her walking down and coming up to me at one of my consoles, and uh, she stops and she says, it is illogical that this carbon-based unit, meaning me, should uh, be in charge of warp engines. And before Decker has a chance to answer her, I cut in and I lean across the console to her and I say, Lassie, if I were being logical right now, I'd be showing you the inside of our trash metal compactor. Mel Atke, playwright, you're still in the pre-production process of Grand Finale. How did you come to recruit Jimmy Dewey for the lead role? Well, it was interesting. Uh, I had read an article in a magazine a couple of years ago where Jimmy had tried to get the rights to Billy Bishop Goes to War in the U.S., and uh, he wasn't able to get them, but my sister said to me, well, obviously he's looking for this sort of a one-man tour de force type of show, so why not send him the grand finale, which we did last October. We didn't hear from him for about six months until uh, February. He called one night and was coming into Toronto <laughs> in two days, and <laughs> we went to the Prince Hotel for sushi, which I'd never had before, and I turned to Kate and asked her if it had alcohol in it. <laughs> And uh, that's basically where we started. Uh, Jimmy came back into town again last month, and we did a uh, read-through of the show, along with Richard Azunian, who, with, with all the pieces coming together, will likely be the either the producer or director. Name? Farrow. Vincent Alexander Farrow. Age? Oh, 55 to 75, although I'm usually cast at around 60. I meant your age. Uh, my age, uh, I'm 62. Because we are dealing with a theater that is not a theater, really, and an audition that is not an audition, really, as the show goes on, we have to be in a place that can really not exactly be a stage. There has to be, to use a much abused word, there has to be some magic. We have to, through the use of paint and scrims and lights and, and black magic in the sense of things that we hide behind black velvet, and black velvet can move very carefully and you don't suddenly realize it's moved and there's something else there, we have to be able to give a whole taste and feeling of a man's life on stage. And at no point should we ever know that we've moved. It's, that's what I mean with sleight of hand. I don't want the audience to ever say, look at that magical transformation but I'd like them to be able to suddenly say, I think we are in a dressing room. I think we are outside this theater. I think we are in a park where this man had a 
brief fling 30 years ago. I think we are in a seedy apartment where he's about to order in Chinese food. But it's how we do it is the key to this. Uh, the play changes subtly as well. It's not one of these blackout sketch things where wham, bam, now we're here, wham, bam, now we're there. The present and the past and the future dovetail. Sometimes they exist on one level for a couple of minutes until the threads separate and you find out exactly where you are. It's up to us to make sure the audience never gets confused. And it's also up to us to keep that sense of magic, that we can start at, at point one and return back to point one. But along the way, we have to go through a lot of other points without drawing attention to how we're doing them. Come on now, Mr. Farrow. Don't you think you're a little um, advanced to play the Prince of Denmark? Besides, we already have someone in mind for the part. Who is that? An actor with a vast reputation. Who is he? Edmund Keane. Very funny. It's not supposed to be. How on earth? It came down to a choice between Keane, Sir Ralph Richardson, and John Barrymore, but Keane read rather well, so I tend to favor him. I don't know, what do you think? Well, I've never seen him act. Oh, it's a shame. He played Oedipus for us last season. Caused quite a sensation. I bet he would. You know, in fact, I think we'll have quite a stellar cast. It looks like we'll have James Mason, Richard Burton, and Charles Lawton in the supporting roles. Look, you can have whomever you dream up, but I'm leaving. Oh, no, wait a minute. You haven't heard the best part yet. Your old friend, Tyrone Guthrie, is going to lend us a hand. I think you mean the late Tyrone Guthrie. Oh, you're not going to get hung up on that, are you? In grand finale, you go completely in the opposite direction from somebody who has made it to somebody who is trying to make it. An actor with a modest reputation, but who is not modest. What is this man's problem? Well, it's, a, it's, always, a, it's, a, it's always a question of, uh, of ego, uh, in a way. Um, the, to me, the grand finale is, uh, is such a terrific play. It's about uh, uh, an actor who is about my age, um, and he's uh, auditioning for heaven. He doesn't know it at first. But he uh, he finds out that uh, this is the problem, and he has he has a lot of problem with uh, the director, who's uh, who's the guy in charge of either getting you in or getting you out. You know, it could be God Himself, it could be Saint Peter, it could be uh, I mean uh, Mother Anne. <laughs> you know, uh, who knows? Uh, the whole thing is uh, that it's a character that I would love to create, and. Uh, uh, to me, uh, uh, I've done uh, over 130 stage plays anyway, but I haven't done any for uh, the past 10 years. And uh, really, uh, I, I've been looking for a play, and this is it. James Dewan came to Toronto four times at his own expense for a series of intense workshops. You'd be surprised. Uh, let's hope they're hanging on every word, but they don't always. Yeah. You know? And... Uh, it has to be laid out. In other words, uh, you were uh, you may have been great with the critics uh, that came to see the plays, but uh... Yeah. what if you said something like, um, perhaps we we take a look at what the real critics said? That, that might give work. The emphasis on... That might work. Although there had been significant press interest, we didn't actually have a producer on board, and there was no financial backing. Kate and I were frantically struggling to bring it together. You started out with a script in hand, Mel. What kind of reaction did you get from the theater community in Canada about this play, Grand Finale? Well, when I first discussed the idea with people, it was almost always unanimously positive. I mean, everybody need to say an audition for heaven, and they burst out laughing. When it comes down to trying to nail them down, uh -huh. it's very difficult. I'll tell you my feelings as far as the two children are concerned. Uh, I originally wasn't going to bring them in, but I like having them there. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that it is set up as being a one-man show, mm -hmm. and then it's blown. And that could have an el that should be treated with an element of surprise. Mm -hmm. Oh, certainly. I think it's a matter of fact that because the audience has to expect a one-man show. Yeah, and they can then they can then be surprised and oh, here we go into something new and. Now, if we want, we can make, you know, concentrate on making the first half of it more of a tour de force and setting up more like it's a one-man show. And, and maybe having a little bit of discomfort on the actor's part with the fact that he's sharing a stage with somebody else. Mm -hmm. 
Now, Norman came up with another idea that he thought of was having, if the voice of the director is going through a PA system, is having it so that the source of the sound keeps bouncing around the room. Yeah, it can be all over the place. Yeah. You can have, you can have systems that, you know, they could be fantastic. Yeah, and uh, he thinks that it would be good, you know, first of all, part of the body language of the actor can be squinting, looking out into the house, trying to figure out where the act, where the director is, and it can be a running gag through the show, mm -hmm. sure. the fact that you have a line, and suddenly, within a second, the director's at the other end of the room. Yes, yes. And it enforces more the idea of an omnipresent director. Yes, yes. somebody can be anywhere at any time. <laughs> yeah, I like that idea. Yes. We, uh, at the last reading, I gave Jimmy what I thought was the tape of the first reading with right. Richard Azinian. Yeah. And he got it home to play it back, and it turns out it wasn't. It was the tape my sister was using to try to <laughs> teach the cockatiel to talk. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I, I turn it on, and um, yeah, I says, Hello. Hello. Unfortunately. We never did find a producer to take the show on, and the theatre where we planned to stage it closed its doors. In another setback, due to a change in management, CBC Radio decided not to proceed with closed session. But important lessons had been learned. My next songs revealed a more conversational approach to lyric writing. And I like your hair. Someone give you all those clothes. Those are quite a pair. Like the ones my mother sews They're not really bad They're just sort of quaint and bizarre Would you like a bite? Grab a pizza after school No, I'm turning right Hang a left before the pool Well, that's really great Get a chance to know who you are Although the theatre scene in Toronto was growing rapidly, there were no producers prepared to take on new musicals by new writers, and so, in 1991, I headed for London. In the right kind of place, with the right kind of wife, he might have had a chance at the right kind of life, with a woman who was shy and free of any whim. Never gives a care for anyone but him. You can't know the kind of wife he needs till you know the kind of life he leads. But life doesn't offer second chances. Standing so still while the clock advances. It's ironic that a move to England would bring me closer to New York. One Sunday afternoon, I went to the Theatre Museum hoping to see Green Willow, one of a series of lost musicals presented in a concert reading. Unfortunately, they were down to their last ticket, and an elderly American man also wanted to see it. As it turned out, we both got in, and he sat next to me. Afterward, he invited me to join him for dinner. Bob Sickinger had been a director of some note in Chicago in the 1960s, running the Hull House Theatre. Playwright David Mamet, who had worked for him as a teenager, claimed in an Esquire article that Bob Sickinger was one of the greatest directors he'd ever known. Among his other protégés were Jim Jacobs and Warren Casey, the creators of Grease. That day, the wheels were set in motion for a long-distance collaboration. Bob would send scripts and tapes from New York, while I sent scores and lyrics from London. I think on uh, Marie's Lament, uh, Second Chance, I think that should go much slower than what we have there, you know. And uh, let's keep together as a team. And I'm, I'm just really knocked out with, you know, with what you've done. 
Uh, I'm real happy, and I hope that you'll be that happy with it, too. Our first project together, a musical based on the Willa Cather novel, O Pioneers, opened at Producers Club 2 in Manhattan in April 2001. In a studio in New York, director Robert Sickinger is auditioning actors and singers for a new musical version of the Francis Hodgson Burnett novel, A Little Princess. If you were to see a clown in his floppy pagliaccio shoes, take a tumble falling down in his bold endeavor to amuse, you'd worry he might break or bruise. But something in your ardent peak Appeals to my enlightened streak For no one of a topsy-turvy air Is genuine and true And no one in this fizzy-headed world Is quite as grave as you But still your face is long And now I need you to be strong Keep up your chin, you're marching bravely now, and no farewell is just what comes before hello. You mustn't cry, your daddy's soldier girl, and you'll be safely in my arms before you know. For wherever chance may find us, there's another power that binds us. And whatever force is tearing me away, though its danger may be looming and its fire all consuming, it's not as strong as what makes me long to stay. Show me your face. Your For this show, Bob is adapting the script in New York while I write the music and lyrics in London. We communicate by fax, email, tape, and occasionally in person, in either city. Emily, remember she recorded this, you know, in a higher key. We brought it down to a B flat, but this is not the uh, key that she will sing the next time when she comes back. But it'll give you an idea, and any ideas you have about any of these songs, you know, let me know too.
In our version, the story is set in the American Civil War. Colonel Crew has enlisted in the Union Army and left his beloved daughter Sarah in the care of Miss Minchin and her school for young girls. A little princess, a future queen, a little pipsqueak of the likes I've never seen, a little dreamer, Miss Sarah Crew. She'd best learn to sever what will never come true. Sarah is told that her father has been killed in battle. Maybe I was never a princess. Suddenly it all turns pale. Suddenly it seems I'm waking from a fairy tale. department has sent this letter found on the battlefield. I'm so sorry, Sarah. I'll be all right, Miss Marriott. My papa is dead, Emily. Dead in battle. Hundreds of miles away. If he were here to talk to you, what do you think he'd say? Raise your head and don't lose faith. Screw your courage to the sticking place. You're sure to find your way. Carry on and you'll find King Princess. Two-hander musical Perfect Timing was a finalist in the 1996 Musical of the Year competition in Aarhus, Denmark, and I became a writer associate of Mercury Musical Developments. Does it matter anymore if I'm feeling anything? Upright and perfect and easy to see used to be, refused to be for me, hopelessly hopeful and knowingly blind, a naked God that's very hard to find. Somebody promised a miracle, 
Somebody promised to tell me who to be. So complimentary, discreetly vivacious, a fish out of water. My first book, When We Both Got to Heaven, was published by Natural Heritage Books in 2002. This autumn, the same company will publish my next book, Broadway North, The Dream of a Canadian Musical Theatre.